Do you like to look good? You know Aaron and Trent do with that hairdo they have. Check out outerregspomade.com. That's outerregs with an S, pomade.com. They have five different hair care products that you can check out. They have hashtag basic, the dirty mic, the pipe hitter, the original pomade, and then they have the beach bum spray uh, that all go in your hair. I've used some of it. Um, it's really good. And funny enough, it smells really good too uh, and works well. They also have stuff for beard care. If uh, you need some beard oil or beard conditioner, uh, they have tattoo cream that you can use to help keep this, that fresh ink that you've got uh, looking nice. And they also have stickers, hats, and apparel that you guys can check out. Um, this is also a veteran. He's an Air Force guy, um, still young in his career, but I mean, he's killing it already. And uh, really this out of Rex pomade is fantastic. So use the promo code ones ready at checkout to get yourself a discount. Um, help them because they help us. Hey everybody. Welcome back to another exciting and incredible episode of the ones ready podcast. Our guest today, I, I don't think really needs an introduction. So we'll just hop right into it and uh, he can tell his story a lot better than I can. But uh, Mr. Stu Smith can't say how excited we are, but welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really honored to be part of it. Uh, you guys are doing great things over there. And I, I enjoy seeing you on social media, telling the truth and positive messaging. I mean, that's you can't ask for more. I mean, you could definitely ask for more from us. I, I'm not sure <laughs> how well we're doing. Uh, no, but, you're I mean, doing great. But that, that's I mean, the goal. We're not, we're not giving out free programs like you are. So, <laughs> well, you know what? You, you could. It's real easy. You know, all I did was t about 24 years ago, I started doing workouts. There were just my workouts that people, I just invited people to join. Next thing I know, I got 25 people showing up, and um, we've been doing it ever since. So it, it's been a lot of fun. So I think if people don't know you, which is is weird, or know about you, uh, if we could start from the <laughs> beginning, kind of where did this this whole thing sure. start at? You know, like your background and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I've always been active. Um, you know, grew up in a small town in North Florida and played sports, and you know, did well in school, well enough to you know go to the Naval Academy, and um, originally. Um, Want to be a pilot after watching Top Gun 36 years ago. And, uh, you know, I wanted to play football, too, at Navy, and I didn't either. So uh, reality kicked me in the, in the nuts real quick in that first year and um, had to reacclimate myself and figure out how to get through that uh, training program and wound up, you know, going into the SEAL teams. Um, or right to Bud's training right after the Naval Academy and then into SEAL teams where I was at uh, SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 2 for extended tour and then wound up going back to the Naval Academy and being uh, running the SEAL program there, their SEAL prep program, as well as their remedial programs. Um, and you know what? I really enjoyed doing that. It means I'm, almost more than I did, you know, being – at the SEAL teams. I enjoyed training people. I enjoyed coaching people. And this was in 1999. So it was a different world before, you know, 9-11 occurred. Um, and I, I got, I got into coaching um, right after I, I got out of uh, the Navy and I've been doing it ever since. And, you know, it's hard to make a living just coaching. So, you know, I'm, I work out and write about it basically, you know, and I've been writing articles and books and uh, fitness programming for pretty much anything that has to do with military law enforcement or firefighter fitness. So, which they now call tactical fitness. Back when I started, it was, I called it military law enforcement and firefighter fitness. It didn't really roll off the tongue, but uh, <laughs> about, about 2008, I first heard the term tactical fitness and I said, called my publisher up we got to write a book called tactical fitness and uh so we, we did that so miss that so, opportunity so it's for tactical fitness <laughs> 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 well have you been yeah. so you've been getting um all kinds like it, it hasn't been just military you i mean it looks like you're wearing a firefighter shirt right now yeah um so yeah. i mean you've been 
you New probably get all all kinds of communities. You know, border patrol. Actually, where you're at, you may not get too much border patrol, but um, you've been crushing it for for quite some time now. Well, thank you. You know, I've figured out a system. You know, I think if you're going to get into the fitness business, you need to figure out your population that you want to focus on. I think a lot of people go into fitness and they just are too broad, right? You're you're there for everybody. And, you know, you really need yeah. to find your, your niche market. And, you know, I saw a need back in the late 90s for pre-military, pre-law enforcement, pre-firefighter training. And in two phases, and this is part of my tactical fitness, you know, um, education to people is that there's really two phases you have to focus on is you got to get to the training by crushing a fitness test. And then you, because, and especially if it's a competitive program, you got to do really well on that. And of course, other medical and, you know, stuff like that. Um, And then the other one is getting through the training. And that depends on your boot camp, academy basic training, selection, you know, all of the different, you know, programs that are out there to screen you if you were going to get that job. And, you know, those those aren't really difficult things to find out, you know, about like these are the standards. And being a coach, I was luckily, you know, I found people to help prepare for those journeys, you know, for last 25 years and you know so i saw this you know one kid who made it through ranger training this kid made it through F- fbi school this kid made it to swat training you know and eventually i had this database of training programs that i had written for them personally that i basically just turned into more content for either articles or for actual downloadable products and other published books even, and just kind of created a library of anything out there that requires a fitness test or, uh, you know, training to get through selection programs. Um, I kind of have an answer to it. And I tell people all the time, I have a way to train, not the way to train, right? So there's many ways to train. This is just an answer to it. And uh, if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, there are Many other ways out there that uh, can work for you if you put in the time. I find that that's a problem. You know, like the the older you get and the more education you get about any given subject, and you you (laughs) become a lot more flexible in in how you reach those solutions. And then when you talk to like 16, 17, 18 year olds, they're like, what do I have to do? And you're like, man, there's there's a hundred different ways you can make it to the finish line. But like, that's not what they want to hear. So like, how do you get past stuff like that? Like what you just said? Well, um, I tell them to first be patient because it, you may have to go through some trial and error to figure out what is actually working for you. And then when you're seeing results, don't be in a rush to go do something else, right? You know, keep doing it until you kind of, you know, we all kind of go through these little curves up and then we stagnate and then we, you know, maybe you can come down and then you find another one and, you know, it's a journey. Um, so that, I guess that's where my education, you know, to the younger generation tends to go. I try to make them be a little more patient with the process, trust the process, find the right one that works for them, and then whatever technique is, that's going to help them get over the hump, that's where I come in as a coach, whether it's you know, an actual physical technique and swimming or running or lifting or whatever, or it's just better programming um, for the guys and gals that are, you know, going out for these jobs. Um, I will say this, you know, for, for most people, I, I have to pull the reins on them, especially the guys wanting to go into spec ops. I'm like, why are you doing this to yourself? You're doing too much. You know, you're wondering why you're not seeing results is because you're just dog ass tired at the end of the week and you're just grinding way too much. Uh, yeah. I like that you said, trust the process because that is one of the things that, you know, uh, you, you tend to ask the questions of like, well, why are we doing it this way? Why are we, you know, why are you, you know, you brought it up in terms of overtraining or, or pushing too hard. Like, why are you, why are you deloading me this week or, or this two weeks? Why, why am I only going at a, 
like I can walk this pace and maybe not walk this pace, but like, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm essentially doing an airborne shuffle. Like, wh- what is this about? Like this, I can't be getting better, but if you, if you push yourself so hard every single day, um, and you haven't even gotten to any kind of selection, whether it's, you know, buds or, or ANS yeah. or SWIC or anything like that. Like you're going to crush your body before you even get there. So, uh, yeah, trust the process. And especially with somebody like, you know, you who are, who are programming, like you're tailoring these programs to, to their bodies and, and you have to recognize. And that is one of the questions as well is how do you recognize when I'm just being tired or weak or fatigued or like, I really need to listen to my body and throttle back. Yeah. You know, that's a really good question because, you know, fatigue and failure are kind of two different levels of, uh, of training. And, and it, I, I take it to another extreme of saying, you know, there's a fine line between mental toughness and stupidity. <laughs> and and usually it kind of borders on that line is where you're training. You know, you're trying to just avoid being stupid and getting injured and, you know, overtraining and seeing negative results. But then you're also wanting to push some perceived limitations. So you're seeing positive results. So a lot of times, you know, it you do have that gut check that takes you over into the stupid zone and, you know, that's okay, but you don't want to do that day in, day out and just wind up, you know, wondering why you're seeing negative results. You're injured all the time and you're just, you're really whittled down to nothing before you even start selection. I mean, I've seen that. I mean, when I was at one of our courses back in the day, which incidentally is the first time I saw your name on a piece of paper that was like printed out and thrown in the gym. It was is interesting about 2008, uh, but okay. like it, it was the same thing because we had like a three month program, and like you know like when students show up, it's a it's a weird process that happens, right? When they show up, they don't want to do anything you want, you know, like that you have to force them to do everything, and then by the end, when you're like, hey, okay, we're done with the three month program, like you need to take a week off and then a ramp up week and then get back into the next program, they have a real hard time just easing off that gas pedal. I think they there's something addicting about the just crushing yourself every day and, and living exhausted to throw the, the hoist uh, thing out there. Yeah. Um, that's a good one. So like, yeah, I think, I think you're right. I don't know how you get past that with the mentality of, of most of the folks that want to do these jobs or get past that. Um, the perception that what we do is just crush ourselves all day, every day. And that's the lifestyle. And that's the only way to be successful. So I don't know. I was just making an observation. It's well, you know, I, I, I have, I have hard workouts. I I love hard workouts. I just did so many 800s today. I just about, you know, just about to died. Um, you know, and 800s are the worst. They are. The you know, worst. Four, yeah, yeah 400s are, you know, you can do 400 repeats, you know, all day, but you know, the 800s are just another notch of suck. Um, yeah. but you know, one thing I force all my guys to do and originally I started this with just me because at 40, you know, 13 years ago, um, I, I thought I was pretty broken and I might not even run. I, I, my running was going to be limited cause my hips were all jacked up. And so I, I created this little mobility day for myself in the middle of the week. And I've originally, it was just me doing it. And I'd have the other guys doing their thing because they didn't want any part of this old man mobility day. Right. I said, all right, that's fine. You do what you want to do. I'll set it up for you, but I'm doing <laughs> this. And if anybody is like aching, anybody has any aches and pains or maybe shin splints can't go for this run stick around with me and my mobility day is this it's kind of like a a spin class meets a yoga class and they have a baby right so it's you got five minutes of biking not necessarily hard but not easy either and then five minutes of stretching foam rolling massage tooling whatever you do that for an hour so you get you know five or six sets of that and i'm telling you it was life-changing from, from day one of doing that. And, you know, within a few weeks, you know, I didn't have those same pains that I was having that was making me think I need to limit my running. Right. And I was able to, you know, pick back up and, you know, still, still running, you know, 20 to 30 miles a week, you know, depending on when, when we are in the cycle. And, 
you know, my hips feel great. You know, they're feeling better at 53 than they did at 3940. So that's, that's pretty good. So I, I think I found a key to longevity right there, you know, just adding that midweek mobility day. But, you know, if you look at what longevity is, longevity is really the mastery of recovery, right? So you have learned how to recover to a point where you can just keep doing what you're doing. But optimal performance is also the mastery of recovery, right? You're, you're not going to perform at your best unless you thoroughly understand what recovery is. And I mean from nutrition to sleep to smart programming, hydration, electrolytes, you know, all of those things come into play for you to recover and be able to do what you want to do the next day. And now everybody in our whole group does that midweek mobility day. And we do another one at the, you know, like a late weekend Sunday mobility day on their own, uh, just get ready for the new week. And what that has done is it has done two things for our group, noticeably reduction in overuse injuries, whether it's a tendonitis or running injury or impact injuries. Um, And it has also increased performance on those later week workouts so you know if you're you, you, you you've done it have a friday or saturday workout and you're just beat down from the end of from you know being the end of the week well this one you know instead of going in at it at like 60 percent because you're burnt out you actually you know you're back up to 80 85 percent you're able to get a little bit more you know out of those late week workouts do you uh- you bring up uh, longevity, which obviously, you know, is, is great for you being at, I think if I'm doing my math right, 53, I'm yep. at the latter part of my career as well as, as Trent. But like, I, I kind of have a theory and I'm interested to see what you, what you think about it. And I, I know there's going to be some a heartache about it probably out there, but Here like we, go. we, we, we get a lot of, um, you know, with a lot of the retired and the VA uh, claims and that kind of stuff, you know, back problems, hip problems, stuff like that. And you're teaching folks at an early age how important mobility and recovery is. I would love to see the data, and not that you would have it because we're not there yet, but I would love to see the data yeah. on, uh, and not just with you, with all the human performance that are, are integrated into all the SOCOM programs now, your, your, your POTIF programs and stuff like that. Seeing all these folks that are now educated in how to mobilize, recover, how that will then translate to later on at the VA claims. Because I, I personally think that we could probably save a lot of money. The VA could save a lot of money instead of doing paying for, for these VA claims. Um, you know, paying for punch cards or whatever to yoga studios, to massage studios, to, I mean, here in Vegas, I, I just saw this and it's phenomenal. It's a, it's a stretching studio where you go, instead of paying for a massage, right? They have all these tables and contraptions and you go in there and they have stretch specialists that are, mm. that are work, working through moves. I was like, this is genius. Like I, I, I want to go see them here in the next couple of weeks just to see what they're doing. But like it's it's incredible, and I I just I personally I think that we could cut some costs at least from the from the government and the VA side of the house, and continue this longevity for people just by the education that you and and so many of these human performance folks are providing. More yeah, of a well, statement, well, thank you. not a question. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. Thank you. I I actually wrote an article, and I don't you know I don't sell my mobility day. It is information out there for anybody to take it. Now, it is in my programming. If someone were to buy my programs, that Wednesday or Thursday is a set mobility day. Um, And even for the spec ops guys, even for the waterborne spec ops guys, we even take mobility day into the pool. And, you know, for people who can't do an egg beater, you know, they can do like the scissor kick tread. I have found that the number one answer to getting people to learn the egg beater is through mobility. It is ankles, hips, and knees that get you in that basic, you know, alternating breaststroke kick. And most people's ankles, hips, and knees are so tight that uh, 
they can't do the egg beater. And I have actually taken this last month doing uh, two mobility days a week and treading at the same time with four people who failed a tread test. They were trying for some recon training. And uh, in a month, they completely turned around their ability to tread, not because I taught them necessarily how to tread. I just got them more flexible and able to do that. And it, and it worked like this, just like me explaining my mobility day. We did it in the pool. So you spend five minutes treading, right? You spend five minutes stretching, right? And foam rolling, you know, whatever massaging you need to do to, you, you feel it when you're treading, you're like, oh, my hip's tight. Right. So yeah. you go loosen the hips, you know, you go loosen the hips up, you know, for five minutes and you just do five minutes on five minutes off. Next thing you know, you're learning how to tread because you can actually get into a powerful treading position, you know, and actually produce downward force. So you go up and uh, that that article I wrote is called Don't Skip Mobility Day. Right. You know, just like, you know, the play on Don't Skip Leg Day, it's like yep. Don't Skip Mobility <laughs> Day. And uh it's out there. It's it's free for anybody to put it wherever they want in their week. And I've even done it on a week. Maybe I was I was just coming off a of sickness or something. I had bronchitis like a year and a half ago, and uh, I did a whole week of mobility days. You know, so what it enabled me to do was stay kind of limber, feel like I was doing something, but not overdoing it to where you know if I got too aerobic, I'd start coughing. You know, so I kept it low. And, uh, you know, came right into the next week after having not done anything and, you know, was not sore, was able to pick it back up. And, you know, so it was kind of like a nice little systems check week to where you just kind of stay where, you know, stay in the game. You keep those habits of the 530 a.m. workouts going, you know, you just just keep rolling with it and you're able to you know, continue into your training so much quicker, even after, you know, injuries or illness, um, you know, and then learn new skills that mo lack of mobility were, was preventing. But it's not sexy and it doesn't, it doesn't bode well on the gram. So I think that's why a lot of people don't do it. Or like, you know, yeah. seriously, it's, it sounds silly, but like, I mean, now, it's, I show my it, mobility day every Wednesday. <laughs> if you, you go to my Instagram, it is like me doing some goofy stretch and, uh, and it's all about consistency. Yeah. I will say if anything on my Instagram, it's all about consistency. Monday's, uh, you know, a calisthenics or weight day, Tuesday's a hill day, Wednesday's mobility. You know, we just go through the week and, uh, you know, it's just kind of, yeah, it, it takes consistency in all of it. You know, and as you know, you know, if you're going to go in these tactical professions, you know, you have to be good at all the elements of fitness. And if you think about what are all the elements of fitness, you got power, strength, speed, agility, you know, anaerobic and aerobic endurance, um, muscle stamina, flexibility, mobility, grip. You know, all of those things are required to just be good at doing. You know, and your athletic history may even make you great at a couple of those, but there's usually a corresponding weakness with one or two of them when you're great at one of them. So you just got to be good at all of them, you know, to, to get through, you know, these type of jobs. And plus, you know, your tactical profession requires you to be good at it because one day, you know, you're going to be in a situation where your fitness and your ability to understand all these elements of fitness and your tactical training is going to save the day. It's going to save your life. It's going to save somebody else's life. It's going to save your buddy's life. Yep. You know, that it's that important. So when I get a young kid, like you mentioned earlier, like, you know, every now and then I get somebody that says, I want to serve, but I just can't get motivated to train. I always throw that at them because, you know, it's that important. You know, your ability your fitness ability is going to be life saving one day. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think Man, that doesn't want you to go run through a wall. I don't know what will. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm yeah, out. Exactly. I'm going to go work out right now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or, or, you know, find another job. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm all about people discovering whether or not they really want to serve or not. 
you know, when I, I get a lot of people that work out with me for four or five months and they say, you know what, that maybe this isn't for me. Right. Yep. But then I get a whole bunch that, you know, go crush their training programs and serve. And I got people retiring now. So it makes me feel old. So, well, <clears throat> that, that like leads into what I wanted to ask next, because I wanted to get back into the history a little bit. When you, when you first went back to the academy and you were put in charge of the uh, the uh, SEAL prep training program uh, for these aspiring SEALs and all that, what what was missing from most people's programs? Like as, as a SEAL, you're you're a problem solver. You know, so I assume you approach the situation, you see gaps, you fill gaps, and then through an, a, a process of self-education, you know, you kind of end up where you are today. But what were the the, the glaring uh, things that were missing in the beginning? Well, I will say this, uh, you know, with the, th there's two ends of the spectrum, right? You, you got the guys wanting to go for spec ops and they're hardcore, almost too hardcore, right? They're just doing dumb stuff. Right. They're just constantly kicking themselves in the ass. They want the gut check. You know, they want to go and do a marathon with no preparation just to say they sucked it up. Right. You know, and that, and that, you know, I tell this, I had this one guy who wanted to go do a hundred mile race and he had no business doing a hundred mile race. Um, and I said, well, here's the deal. You know, you're going to go run a hundred miles this weekend. I'm going to continue doing my 25 miles a week for the next two months. And let's see who accumulates the most miles in the next two months. Right. <laughs> and that guy was broken when he got back, had a stress fracture in his foot and had almost needed hip surgery. And I was like, he didn't run for almost three months. I was like, it's just, it's just stupid. So that, that's that fine line between mentally tough and stupid. You know, I would rather show up six days a week, accumulate 25 miles in a week and do that for three months versus do one butt kicking hundred mile race and be, you know, incapacitated forever. Um, so that's the one end of the spectrum that gets, I have to pull the reins on. Then there's the other one that just needs education. They need to learn how to train. Um, so the unique thing, unique position I had, at the academy is I worked with the remedial failures on swimming and PFT and stuff like that. But I also worked with the spec ops guys. So it was, it was really two different models of training where you just try to meet in the middle, right? So you try yeah. to pull back a little bit to get these guys a little smarter on not overtraining. And then you try to push a little bit on this side to get them a little smarter on just how to train and how to train smarter because they're smart kids. I mean, they yeah. just never really learned how to train. So it's just like taking a class. So I almost treated it like, you know, they were taking a academic course and, uh, you know, explain to them, this is how you're going to see better results on a fitness test. And then I, I compare it to like the chemistry test they're about to go take. Now, is there any reason why you would go and take this test and strive for a D? Because that's what you're doing right now by striving for the minimum standards on the fitness test. Yep. I said, you're here at the Naval Academy for a freaking reason, right? Not for the minimum standard, right? So anyway, so I, that was kind of my approach there. And I kind of just took that approach and applied it to everybody. And I, I raise the standards, you know, like exceeding the standard is the standard, right? So there's no minimum standards. And because I always hated that, you know, because if you're going with for the minimum standards, you are just barely surviving, right? And, and in this world, you got to compete and, you know, be at the top end of that, uh, you know, whatever group that you're in, you, you want to be in the, the higher end of that, especially if you have an attrition rate course that's, you know, 75, 80 percent you want to be top 20% minimum. <clears throat> right. I think a lot of times people think that we're just given that lip service. So when we say, you know, the exceeding the standard is a standard or, Hey, you need to be um, not, not meeting the minimums. Cause like we've, we've got a, a discord channel. Well, we don't have a discord channel aspect. War has a discord channel and you see some of these new folks that they, Hey, they just took their very first IFT and, 
And they thought the whole time that, like, hey, I'm, I'm crushing my runs, I'm crushing my swim, my pull-ups, my push-ups. But they never combined them all. They just were doing pull-up workouts, and they're like, hey, I'm crushing 15 pull-ups. No big deal, you know? Mm, and, yeah. and the way that our IFT and then everybody within SOCOM's, um, you know, entry-level PT test, is it, it's made to build upon each other and fatigue you. You know, that's why sit-ups yep. are before the run. You know, we're going to crush your hip flexors. You know? Yeah. So instead of just, I'm doing great at push-ups, pull-ups, whatever, you have to combine all that stuff. And it doesn't mean that you do a, a an entry-level PT test every single day. It just means that mm. before you go to your recruiter or whoever it is that's, that's giving you, you know, giving you the blessing, um, like you better not only be able to combine all that stuff, but you better be able to exceed those minimums because on a bad day that you only got four hours of sleep or you didn't hydrate very well the, the day before, or you didn't eat very well, you know, you had a bad day at work or whatever it is or, or school, like there's no excuse when you show up because everybody's full of excuses when they don't pass their test. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, a- absolutely. I mean, that is, you know, like we just mentioned, you know, that is the key to, you know, joining is that you, I, I tell people all the time, you know, you have to be able to crush that PST before you even talk to a recruiter. And if the first time you ever take a PST or a pass test or IFT, you, you have to have practiced that some, otherwise it is a very rude awakening. And then, you know, it, it resets your goals to a much lower standard. Your standard is now, wow, I, I got to get my IFT up better. or I got my PST better um, in order to get accepted into this training program. Whereas you could be focusing on the other elements of fitness that you don't have to worry about the IFT or the PST anymore. You can worry about what's going to get you through the training. Like you can practice more treading and longer swims with fins and longer runs, you know, because those are going to crush you in the future. Mm-hmm. Right. So you got to, like I said, two and through, you got phase one, get it past the test phase two. You got to get prepared for what you are about to endure. And those pipelines are long. I mean, you're talking about, you got one test that you'll take on day one and you will never take that thing again. Right. At least at Bud's. And then you got six months of butt kicking training that a lot of people neglected to do because they started off this journey behind the eight ball by just spending a lot of their recruitment time just barely trying to meet those minimum standards. Yeah. And it's it's the entry level. You you nailed it. It's it's injury level. It's the easiest test you're going to do. And so. You know, I, I'm sure you get a ton of high school kids or, or, you know, even college students and and all that stuff. It absolutely is important. Like, I'm, I'm not discounting this when I when I say this next statement, but in the same line of, hey, dress for the job you want. Like, if you're serious about this and this is what you want to do, you have to time manage appropriately, you know. Maybe it's not going out partying. Maybe it's not, um, oh yeah, whatever you know, whatever it is that's taking you away for it. You know, hang out with your friends because yeah, high school is only one time in your life. You have you have tons of time to be an adult, but you know, continue to play sports in high school. You know, have a good time with your friends, study, but at the same time, like if there's other things that you can um, you can improve on or you can spend spend your time better doing then do it and if you're serious about it then put in the work and put in the effort to get better physically and mentally well i will tell you this you know uh, recruiters don't appreciate me you know because here's why yeah well the local ones do because i know them personally and they know (laughs) i send them good candidates that are that are solid however You know, I I get calls from recruiters all the time when people, when they say, um, did you tell my recruit at 18 years old, he should not go to Bud's at 18 years old? I said, yeah. You know, if he was wanting to be a bosun mate on a ship somewhere, fine. Join the Navy and 
go do your thing. But, you know, most 18 year olds are the major part of the attrition where it comes to, yep. you know, spec war level training. And, you know, I think they might have a five or six percent chance of graduating. You know, I will say this. Every class I'm proven wrong by a handful of 18 year olds. But what doesn't get reported is that that class started out with over a hundred 18 year olds and there's about five left. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I tell kids to be patient. Um, you know, there, there are a few 18 year olds out there that can do it, but they're really are, they really are unicorns when it Mm -hmm. comes to this, um, type of training and, you know, God bless them. You know, they're, they're harder than I was at 18. I would not have been able to do it. You know, it, it took me four years of training at, you know, college level and learning, you know, how to do it, you know, to actually be a good candidate. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's for sure. It's, it's a crazy looking back at, at how often you see just like when you, you know, you see that big first attrition drop. It's always you're, you're left with an older crowd. And there's always those like one or two young guys still hanging around, but you know, they don't always seem like younger guys, but no, it is, it is what it is. I, I wanted to go back to, to practice a little bit. And I, I was thinking about it. I, I was thinking about all the psych work you kind of had to do in the beginning, you know, like as a coach and you're almost a psychiatrist or psychologist at the same time. Yeah. And, and I, I was thinking about these kids that, or people that sometimes when they pass that first test, they almost pass it in like a fight or flight uh, mentality. You know what I mean? And that might give them a false sense of security that like every time I step up to this test, I'm going to pass because like I'm going to have that adrenaline or whatever happened that I so- just happened to pass this test this time. But like if you think about catching a football, right, the first time that quarterback throws that ball at you, if you haven't been practicing, like and you get that adrenaline dump and you're not used to it and you catch that ball, like you might catch the ball, you might not. But like through practice, you know, like the 800th time that that quarterback throws you that ball, you, you do it without even thinking about it. And I think that's that comfort level that practicing these tests over and over and over again is what you want to get to. So you can open up that, you know, bandwidth so you can actually see the field, know what you're doing, and then take those steps. Like you said, after that, after you catch it to, to move the ball down the field, I'm not very good at sports references or no analogy. Great analogy. That's what I got. <laughs> Great analogy. I, I love that analogy. I was a football player too. So it, I, I didn't have hands like a wide receiver. So I just played linebacker, but, okay. um, that was, uh, it was a great analogy, and it makes a lot of sense because I have people all the time that are, you know, showing up, doing that PST, and are just completely spent at the end of it. Like, they just put it all on the line, which is great. They're throwing up at the end of it. Hey, you know, good effort. But then I tell them, now here's the kicker. You did really well. You know, on this test, you got all the scores you needed to do, but now let's try to make it so easy that you can do this after a workout. You can do this while you have the flu or some kind of chest congestion because you're going to get sick along this journey somewhere and you got to take one of these tests with a head cold or, you know, the flu or something like that. And you still have to be able to crush this test. Um, so you got to take it up to that kind of a level to where, yes, it's going to suck, you know, but even on a bad day, you can crush this thing because you, you can't rely on that fight or flight, you know, mode all the time because it's, you know, it, it you may not even have the, you know, energy sources in your body to be able to do that. You know, that's going to depend a lot on your glycogen stores. It's going to depend on, you know, what you ate with, you know, how much blood sugar you have going on, how anaerobic you can be. It's going to depend on temperature. I mean, all of these things matter when you take these tests. And, yeah, the more you practice it, the better you will be. But like like you said, you also don't need to practice it every day. You know, yeah. Yeah, if you if you get if you get if you give yourself you know, several months of training time, you can take that thing twice a month and it's, it's sufficient. And then the the good thing about practicing it so many times is that you learn a strategy on how to take that test, you know, when, when to push, when to pull back, when to pace, you know, all of that comes together and, you know, when to hydrate, 
when to drink some electrolytes and sugar. All of that comes into play whenever you can, you do it enough, you can create a strategy to really win and crush. Yeah. yeah. Do I, do I take the test on an empty stomach or having eaten two hours prior or do I just, Hey, I can run on a full belly. I can't, <laughs> I can't do yeah. it. I can't do that on a full belly. Some people can though, but um, I'm glad you said like it, 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 it just validates cause I'm not, you know, a certified personal trainer, like, like you are and stuff like that. But one of the things that I kind of tell folks is, you know, cause they ask, Hey, how do, how do I know when I'm ready? Because I, I passed a, a PST or I passed an IFT. It's like, well, can you, if you took that test this morning or you, or you had a normal training session this morning, you know, weights or whatever, or did, did, did 800 on the track, could I, at eight o'clock tonight, go in 30 minutes, you're doing a PST or an IFT and you better be able to pass. Like, but I just ate. I, well, sorry, man. That's, that's what happens, you know, and you have to be able to pass it. It doesn't mean that you get the best numbers that you possibly could, or you're as fast as you were or anything, but you at least need to be able to pass. And, and you should be able to do that at, at any time, whether you've trained or not, or if you're lacking sleep, like I said, even if it's just passing the minimums on that like surprise test, that's to me, that's when you know you're like, okay, I could probably fare pretty well in the in the pipeline, whether it's buds or aspect war or whatever. Yeah, that, that's good. It, you know, w- one thing I've learned from my students is, you know, when I see them doing the following, I see them showing up to workouts early in the morning. And then they go to work like this one guy where I learned this next thing I'm about to tell you, he worked construction the rest of the day, right? So he's always on his feet, doing something, working hard, manual labor. So he's ready for a day of spec ops training. Basically, you know, he does some hard work and he's on his feet the rest of the day. You know, he's not working out two hours and then taking a nap and then working out another couple hours and taking a nap. And, you know, he's not doing that. Not that that won't get you there. It's just different. Um, but I remember this guy does our workout and it was like a good butt kicking leg day with, uh, running and Hills and all that. And he said, oh, I got to go take my PST here in, uh, an hour. I'm like, <laughs> damn. Okay. That's pretty good. He goes, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want a PST to ruin my workout. So I was like, <laughs> hell Yeah. That's badass. That is a that is a great <laughs> mentality to have. And then he goes work construction the rest of the day. You know, that was just like and guess what? He made it. Of course. You know, he, he made it through. You know, so it was just, just that kind of ability and mentality um is gonna get you to that next level. No, absolutely. The, and I, I love that kind of mentality. I just <laughs> It's, yeah, I would rather see that. I would rather see that than a guy puking at the end of a PST or an IFT. That's just attention-seeking yeah. behavior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, there is the old saying, you're not trying if you're not puking. And, yeah, I get that, you know. But, you know, when when you have the ability to just crush it, then go crush it again, then go work all day, come back and do it again the next day, I was just like, and you're there. You're ready. That That's the job. Inside. Yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why I think that the whole tactical athlete thing rubs me the wrong way a little bit. Like these are not college athletes like that construction worker example is much more closely related to what we what we do. You know, like it's True. just a grind and a grind and a grind. Like we're not you don't have someone doing your laundry or doing your homework or whatever else like that. Like you're <laughs> you're not that person like you're just getting crushed every day. But um. I did want to ask, going back to the very beginning again, I know I keep jumping back, and I apologize. I don't mind. I don't mind. Um, I'm all over the place, so. Yeah, so you you went to the academy, which is not difficult to get into in the the first place. You you didn't become a pilot. You didn't become a football player. I'm sorry for bringing up old stuff. But, like, what what was it about being a SEAL that really drew you in? You know, like, what was the the Stu Smith reason to to go for the teams, and, and what was that experience like? Well, I was struggling my first six months of the academy to a point where I just went home Thanksgiving and started crying. And my mom said, won't you just come home? And I'm like, I can't quit. Right. And then she was like, well, 
let's figure this out. Let's figure this out. So I actually, um, you know, that was a, that was a, a bad, you know, 18 year old, I call it the typical 18 year old scenario where you leave home, you're in a new city, you're getting yelled at all the time by strange people and you're, you're meeting new friends and, you know, your girlfriend dumps you and, you know, you're trying to meet these standards that you they're way beyond anything. It's just this perfect storm for failure. And that, that was what I was going through at, at 18. And uh, I wound up not making the team, not becoming a pilot, not really because I didn't get there. I just chose not to go that route after I started playing rugby. And I played rugby for the three, three and a half years while I was at the academy. And on that team, at any one given time, there were guys on there, probably seven to eight guys wanted to be SEALs, seven to eight guys wanted to be Marines. And, you know, they were upperclassmen, so they were a few years ahead of me. And then I would see them making it through whatever they wanted to do. So I saw a way to get through. So I, I took them as kind of like mentors of like, okay, this is what they're doing. That's what I'm going to do. Right. So, and then I started working out with them and then I started seeing their study habits and they would just, they take their books down to dinner and then they just go straight to the library. I said, that's what I'm doing. And so I, I just had some good examples of people that were doing the grind, getting through it, working hard, playing hard. Cause it's a rugby team. And, uh, there's always two games at a rugby game. There's the game of the the event, then there's the beer drinking that's after, and that's a, another game. So that that was a good source of social release. I think I needed, as well as you know, the, a good example of people, you know, really taking things to the next level. And what that did for me was it took the impossibility factor of what buds is. Because I'd, you know, I'd seen, you know, this when I was a freshman, I saw seniors making it through buds, and then I saw juniors making it through buds, and you know, every year, all these guys were making it through buds, and I'm like, I could do this. Let me just do what they're doing. I'm doing what they're doing now. Let me see if I can compete on that next level. And, um, you know, that I think that was the turning point for it. You know, for for a lot of us, when you do consider these special warfare jobs, a lot of it has to start off with this isn't impossible right a lot of people think it's so impossible they don't even try right and you know uh so i think that was the first step and then you know after meeting the seals that were stationed there um i was like yeah this is a community i want to do so that there you go that perfect storm you talked about at the beginning is <laughs> so real um I, so, I mean, you know, I was 17 when I came in and that I had never really truly been away from home. You know, you can you can say like, hey, going for two weeks camping or, or whatever it is, is being away from home. Now, when you go to boot camp and then you go to a Buds or a or a, you know, SWIC or A&S, that's yeah. a whole not, that's a whole nother being away from home. And for, for somebody who hasn't done it or you're young and like, you nailed it. It it is, it is wild. I like, so man, I I just, I like that really, (laughs) cause I was, I was in a, in a really bad place. I was fortunate enough that I had, you know, really supportive parents, uh, brother and, and the teammates that I was around, you know, because they were also going through the same thing. That's why, sure. so that's why the, and I don't know what you guys call it, you know, in the Navy, but in the Air Force, we call it cross training. So you have your, your prior service that, you know, they were, did whatever, a mechanic or crew chief or whatever. And now they're trying to go through. So those, those older folks that are prior service that are coming in and like, that's important to, you know, help provide that kind of mentorship and that guidance. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that's huge. So, so when we say, Hey, uh, you you need to be a good NCO while you're going through um, the pipeline. That is that is part of it. Not only you know keeping people in line and discipline and and that kind of stuff and and helping, men- but you're helping mentor people through life, not just in the military. 
I don't know, man, that is just like, it, it brought no, me absolutely. back. <laughs> no, absolutely. You know, that journey, I think for all of us is, is real. And the difference between, you know, success and failure is often one, your attitude, but also two, you know, the people that are surround that you surround yourself with. Um, oh yeah. And, and are able, and they're able to, you know, find people that are good mentors for you. Yeah. So yep. there you go. Well, and, and I think when we, when we say team guys, you know, I think it gets thrown around a lot, but thinking back, you know, you always kind of find your team and your community or it finds you. Right. I think that's just mm -hmm. like the, 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 the inherent nature of, of who we are. Like you found that, that beer drinking team that had a rugby problem. Right. And then <laughs> you guys, I, that, that's not my quote. That's, I think that's a pretty no, classic, a classic rugby, yeah, a classic. rugby yeah, thing. Yes. I just want to put it out there. That's Perfect. <laughs> um, but like when that community finds you and everything clicks into place, like I, I know everybody's like, Oh, on teams. And it's like, when you're in the pipeline, you're a team person. And I, if you gravitate towards that and you're, you're more than just an individual trying to get through this and, and you enjoy having that camaraderie and those people around you, like that's, that's what makes people successful is, is we are team people, you know, and no matter where you go, you're going to find that camaraderie and th those like-minded people that want to grind and work hard. And that's what makes, uh, I think, people successful, not only on the on the teams, but, you know, further out in life, being coaches and all the other stuff. I'm, I'm sure you have a, a team right now, whether it's your students or or other people around you. Yeah. And you know what's neat about the group of people that come to train with me? They come from different states. They find jobs. They find things to do here. They find family members that live nearby, whatever they can do. And they they come here and then they become each other's social group as well. And and that's fun to see because you know I go to barbecues with them on the weekend and we're all hanging out and it's just just really neat to see how it starts coalescing into you know that tight knit group and then I introduce these guys that want to enlist to the Naval Academy guys that I'm also coaching and you know those guys are going to be their officers and so they've already started you know a relationship working out together and. You know, by the time they get to, uh, you know, the buds class, they've actually recognized some familiar faces, um, you know, trust each other in, in certain ways. And um, I, I think one of my best stories is one of my enlisted guys uh, from my local workouts was we were all working out at the academy for about a year before they both went into the Navy and they wound up being the class leader of the class and the senior, uh, like the LPO of the class. So the leading petty officer or like NCO, you know, so they, the guy was the enlisted guy in charge. The other guy was the class officer in charge and they had already known each other for, you know, a year and a half before they, they actually had that class together. So that, that those are kind of the neat things that I think that you just mentioned that the team aspect uh, brings about because it, why it's so important is you will never make it through any of these spec war or any tactical training program really by yourself. You will never do it by yourself. It's always with a team and, you know, your swim buddy or your battle buddy, you know, whatever you want to call them. Uh, you guys are going to do that together. Yeah. Yeah, we're not all Mavericks out here, so it is what it is. I thought it was a great movie. Anyway, moving on. Uh, you know, I'm going to go see it, you know, and I'm going to be nostalgic as hell about it because I won't lie. Top Gun made me say, Navy? Huh. The, and, and, it pushed me, put, put, push me in that direction. One of the greatest recruiting movements of, of all time, whether it was for the Navy or the Air Force. Yeah, I mean, it's... Oh, sure. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we've come to that time. We always like to ask our guests um, if you could boil down everything. You know, we have a lot of people out there. You talk to a lot of people as well. If you could boil it down to one or two pieces of advice for those people looking to get into the communities or or just make their lives better in general, you know, you have a lot of experience. What what kind of uh, advice would you throw out there to them? Well, first of all, I want to give the Air Force Special Warfare a huge shout out. Because they have made some evolutions over the last, I'd say, five, maybe ten years that has really taken all the best practices of all 
special ops in our military and combined it and put it into one program. So, you know, I've seen it evolve. I've seen it evolve when you, before you guys called yourselves battlefield airmen and then you then you became air force special warfare and, um, you know, you broke up into the, you know, special reconnaissance and, you know, all of those new changes that came about that are only going to make the air force better. Um, you know, your, your involvement in technology is, you know, without comparison. I mean, I mean, you guys are a highly technical force. You know, I, I talked to some of the trainers that are, you know, part of your prep programs and it's amazing all the data information they are getting from each individual candidate to a point where, you know, you, you can really tell what's wrong with somebody, you know, just by giving all the information that you, you not only have data, but you turn it into information that is useful. Um, so hats off to the Air Force. In fact, I when I have people that are kind of hemming and hawing, they don't know where to go. I, I actually say you need to consider the Air Force. You know, the Air Force has some really neat opportunities for you in that Air Force special warfare. Um, so my my big thing is this, and I am honored to be a part of any person's journey, you know, throughout this, you know, go from civilian to, you know, tactical professions. And I will say this, you know, a lot of people give the younger generation, we all do, you know, they're weak, you know, they're millennials, they're snowflakes, whatever, whatever you want to call them. Um, I get, you know, I have hope for our future. For the last 24 years, or all the young men and women that come to train with me at before 6 a.m., you know, six days a week, um, and they are wanting to serve. You know, they and in the last 20 years of war, they knew what they were getting into. You know, they knew they were going into combat. I mean, and I didn't have any fewer people showing up. You know, so there's a there's a warrior class out there that I am humbled to be a part of their journey. Um, and you know, my, my advice to people is just find out what you really want to do and, you know, work your ass off to, to make it happen. And, um, and just know that, you know, whatever journey that is, it's going to require one, you to be inspired and motivated to do something but that inspiration and motivation has to slowly evolve into discipline you know and you do that by while you're motivated is build good habits you know be persistent with your training um you know set that time every day and even when you don't feel like it you go hit it anyway and that is that is when you're making discipline and that's when discipline evolves into mental toughness and that is just when you are going to start seeing the type of success you need to get to and through you know these type of hardcore you know spec ops level training programs yeah well Stu, i want to i want to say before before trent kind of closes us up but um like Thanks for what you've done for the last, I mean, not only your, you know, career in the Navy, but afterwards too, because I, I'd be, like, I can't imagine the, the numbers of people that you have shaped, um, just in general, not just that have gone into NSW or, or any of the, the soft backgrounds, but just as a person and those habits that you have instilled in them and then they have definitely impacted other people as well because now they get workout buddies and like it just multiplies and compounding interest and all that kind of stuff. So like kudos to you for, for starting this so long ago and, and can, keeping it up really. It's, it's awesome. And I know that we have like Trent and I and, and the rest of the folks have experienced people that, that you have essentially changed their lives within the soft community. So thank you. Thank you. That's very nice to hear. You know, it's always nice to feel like you've made a difference. You want you know? to. That's and, that's uh, what we want. Yeah. We want purpose, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so. yeah. It, it's, it's, it's hard not to fanboy out. It's weird, you know. Like, and <laughs> and I, I have to remind people that I do this podcast for me. It's not for you. I just do yeah. this so I can meet people like, like Stu here. So really appreciate you coming on. And uh, if people are trying to reach you, 
uh, where, where can they reach you at? Um, Stu Smith fitness.com. Uh, you know, I have a podcast too, which uh, anytime you guys want to be on it, happy to, you know, have you guys on, it's called the tactical fitness report. And we talk about, you know, specifics and tactical fitness stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, uh, I really appreciate, uh, being on this one. I've been looking forward to this one you know, since you invited me, um, just cause I'm, I'm so, um, inspired by what the air force has done because you know it's not often you see a change in direction that is so intelligently done right and you know sometimes change in directions are knee-jerk reactions right and this change in direction is, is very well well done and and you know they're not afraid to make changes because maybe they they realize well maybe this was a little too much and we got to make a a direction change and that's that's what has impressed me you know with the air force you know special warfare process for sure full of nerds that's why <laughs> we are a bunch of nerds <laughs> all right and then for warrior there, nerds i like it that's what we do uh yeah so for everybody out there appreciate you listening don't be afraid to change directions do something with your life Stu, thanks again for coming on and we'll uh, catch y'all later appreciate it thank all you right.